Hello and welcome. I'm so glad to have you, Dr. Rahul. Just tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, thanks, Siddharth. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, a pleasure being on this podcast. Uh, there is a lot that we know about sleep, uh, and uh, that's been my passion area yeah. for a better part of a decade now. To get the message across, there's there's so much we can do, yeah. essentially to improve. Uh, I would say essentially the quality of life. of our patients yeah. like we were discussing so hi everyone um, i am uh, dr rahul modi i am an ent surgeon a ear nose throat surgeon uh, by my qualifications and then um, as my specialty area i specialize in treating patients uh, with um, sleep disorders uh, specifically a disorder called as obstructive sleep apnea uh, a lot of, a lot many of you may have heard about it but it is something which uh, i mean frankly as doctors also we are discovering mm. or learning about only in the past two decades so uh, there it is so i am a sleep apnea specialist if you may and while we have met for the first time today right. i realized there is a lot of overlap yes. between our journeys yes yes uh, you yes. were in kem um, yes. and then you did your uh, masters in um, uh-huh. in pgi chandigarh pgi chandigarh ms correct. in pgi chandigarh yes. i have a question to ask you mm-hmm. about the work life balance when it comes to covid because sure. during the pandemic all of our lives kind of changed yes so how did you manage that work life balance so before pandemic, and after covid in the sense at least the first wave was i mean it was just just life and life right there wasn't much work to do right. our pulmonology colleagues had taken up all the load so yes. to say and uh, second wave uh, was mucor Mm. So we got to see a lot of black fungus, um, and uh, that was got, terrifying. That was terrifying, and we didn't knew what hit us till mm. some time, and then we started to act upon. Fortunately, I would say, Bombay, where I practice, Mumbai, didn't get hit as bad as the rural parts of the country. Speaking of a disease that isn't very common, mm. and so it doesn't spring to people's mind, right? Sleep apnea is like that. Oh, I will correct you there. Mm-hmm. So I would say, so you know, you you touched my favorite topic now. So essentially, sleep apnea is out there. Mm. Uh, whatever we know about sleep apnea so far, from the Western data in in lot of emerging data out of India, it is not that uncommon. Mm. In fact, I would contest that it is almost as common as diabetes, especially if you consider mild sleep apnea. almost as common as high blood pressure is just that i mean the eyes do not see what the mind does not know right, right. so we don't we don't look for it we don't we don't we do health checkups right we test for cholesterol yeah we test for blood sugars we test for thyroid there is awareness yeah we test for vitamin deficiencies we don't screen for sleep apnea yeah. i don't think many healthcare packages do a simple like a stop bank questionnaire like you know a simple screening questionnaire for all their patients right and if they start doing that as part of their health package they can screen patients and pick up it, pick it up i mean i would say fairly regularly at least the moderate to severe form right so, so we will we'll talk about what sleep apnea is, is right. because a lot of people listening might have heard of it but they might not know of it so i mean it sounds like a complicated term yeah but it's actually very simple so sleep apnea is a broad term mm-hmm. where essentially think about apnea is essentially cessation or stopping of breathing right that's apnea somebody stops breathing, breathing for a while that is apnea that's apnea correct and think of it this way there is essentially a simpler way to describe it is sleep disordered breathing hmm there is disorder in breathing while sleeping hmm okay sdb is what it's is a wider term which encompasses you know different forms of sleep apnea the one that is the most common one is called as obstructive sleep apnea yes because these individuals essentially uh, have airway obstructions uh, in their sleep and uh, and people would relate to snoring right mm. so what is the common symptom of sleep apnea snoring right okay um, i would say if not 100% at least 99% adults with sleep apnea would snore children's may can also have so sleep apnea let me just yeah. pause right there you're saying that 99% of patients who have obstructive sleep apnea will have snoring yes but not the other way around correct so not everybody who, who snores, snores will have sleep apnea yeah yeah right. not the other way around correct so 
to tell someone has sleep apnea technically we need to document that the breathing is getting obstructed at night right snoring like we were discussing you know why would a person snore ha huh. like i mean let's let's talk to the basics right i mean like you know snoring is something that i think we all know someone in our families who snore yes sabke ghar mein there is one there is one snore chacha ji one yeah, uncle exactly so that is what i tell yes. everybody is that growing up you always identify that chacha or mama <laughs> whom you are not going to share the room with yes. because that mama snores and it's like a funny family anecdote ki it inke bagal mein nahi sona hai and classically the person is non chalant about it yeah. he is like that is your problem <laughs> my snoring is not my problem right. i mean it's like you know if you have trouble change the room yeah. i can't help it because yeah. and it's not disturbing me so to say um, and which is what we believed right as doctors yeah. till recently i mean like you know the first descriptions of sleep apnea came in the late 70s i mean in the sense in the scientific term i mean there have been papers in the past right. but it's only in the last i would say 30 years where we have started taking it seriously as a sign right. of research right in fact um so resmed the company mm-hmm. had uh, done a research very recently i think sure. march in 2023 uh-huh. where they asked uh, they surveyed people right uh, to find out what is the public opinion on snoring and uh, i think some 58% said that snoring is a good sign it means that the person is sleeping well sleeping well tragedy is and the way our medical curriculum even now if i may i was uh, uh, you know uh, discussing with one of the professors of a of a baroda medical college mm-hmm. at a conference tragedy is even today they should actually survey the doctors <laughs> first and ask all the doctors yeah. across you know across specialties across i would say homeopaths ayurvedas ask everyone do a survey i will doubt you will get a very different number there too i mean like mm-hmm. you know even i mean for the, it has to start there right yeah it has to start there where they will essentially alert their patients i mean i always tell patients i mean i don't need to convince someone to get a blood test done today mm. even if they are asymptomatic about it yeah okay whereas if i tell someone that i think you may have sleep apnea let's get investigated they'll go back to their family doctor who's perhaps not very aware about it right. he would like to chide it away i'm not saying he will but likelihood is something that you are not aware about you would not explore further right, right. so that's 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 the issue yeah snoring was never considered cool in that sense mm. I mean uh so another example that I always think about is obesity. Mm-hmm. So obesity was never cool. You know being obese was never cool. But it was a pure cosmetic thing mm-hmm. till like what about 30 years back. Okay. Say like when we were in school yeah uh we would tease like a mota jadia yeah and it was never a medical issue. Exactly. It was more so of a you will you will uh-huh. go and tell to your colleague or your friend hey lose weight otherwise you'll not get married. lose weight mm. otherwise you know to look good mm. now if you meet a friend who's gain weight you're going to say boss lose weight otherwise you will develop abc you know mm. you will develop high blood pressure mm. so your concern has changed exactly right. so now if someone is snoring and it's all about awareness right it's all about awareness the nature of the disease has not changed right obesity still was responsible for those factors 30 years back uh still was wrecking havoc yeah. but now a it the, has become more common the empathy has changed it's yes. no longer that yes. Uh, yes. yes you are just a fat person eating it's, I it's mean, very different i mean now. there is awareness regarding body shaming now right. right so you would not shame someone correct similarly if you find a friend snoring when he's traveling in the train with you yes. when you're sharing a tent with him on the hike yes. when you're going out yes you need to kind of like just tap on his shoulder and say that boss you were snoring right which is the awareness i would say at least during my time in the us mm-hmm. i was actually surprised with the level of awareness patients had there mm. they were very aware and i mean one of the reasons would be my friend just told me i'm snoring i may have sleep apnea wow. i'm here to get it tested so this was 10 years back right mm. i mean and i don't think that's happening still here yeah. right i mean i mean we so need to so why is that why why is uh, the diagnosis of sleep apnea or the awareness of sleep apnea lagging in india like right. have we missed the boat just in diagnosing it so i mean i think i mean we keep on thinking about it right i mean i have a few of my colleagues across the country and we are very dedicated and we see the, see the the thing is the way i think about it is 
the best part about sleep i am digressing a little bit best part about sleep apnea is if you make the right diagnosis and you treat the patient and we'll talk about treatment options you get a result within week 10 days yes it is a eureka phenomena for the patient the patient is like in which is what you will never get say treating someone who is having asymptomatic high blood pressure again i'm not the expert on high blood pressure but if you have picked up someone who's got borderline tsh levels and started him on thyronorm you've got borderline sugar levels you started lifestyle changes yeah. or you know put him on like a metformin or something yeah. at the initial part and you will never get that satisfaction whereas sleep apnea you treat the patient and within a week yeah. that patient will come back with a smile on his face and he is get doc saab life bana diya so Apne. much gratitude ha so that is what drives us yeah as doctors that is what we want right yeah. pick up the right diagnosis fix it for the patient like for you guys for neurologist it's like parkinsonism right you pick <laughs> oh, up a yes. patient with movement disorder yeah. bad movement disorder in those rural days i would say yeah and you treat as movement disorder give the proper syndopa and you know whatever the drugs that you give yeah and uh, and it's he goes to a miracle it's it's actually. it's like you know that guy started walking like you know oh, yeah. he, he's like so now coming to the question about why i think part of the reason is i mean our curriculum doesn't highlight it hmm. as a chronic disease we read tomes and tomes about tuberculosis yeah bronchial asthma diabetes mellitus yeah. hypertension because i mean essentially we are researching on it for a better part of i would say a century and a half yeah in uh, my practice the commonest reasons for me to do a sleep study which happens almost once a week right. i think i i do a sleep study almost once a week right and it's always subtle things yes you know it's it's somebody who has got some memory problem right lack, lack of attention right. they are not able to focus at work right. and all other reports are normal yes they have been going around for the last 2 3 years sure. with these complaints right and they are getting frustrated right. and just a couple of questions about sleep snoring sleep yes. study done and yes. they are on treatment and in yes. one month they are fine right it is one of the most satisfying diseases to treat absolutely absolutely and i feel it should be a i mean i hope and that is my kind of uh, i mean i would say aim in life mm -hmm. is to make a diagnosis easy um, and to make uh, the treatment accessible right it should not feel and and essentially it will start with making awareness in your family medicine doctor Yeah. in your md medicine doctors once they are comfortable in screening in reading sleep studies then i mean i think that would be the game changer yeah that would be the game changer in treating sleep apnea and i mean i have you know boat load of these stories where you know patients are on you know a lot of medications um i have seen a lady and again i mean it's it's more complex than that with depression issues mm. but uh mood was better but the fatigue wouldn't go mm. just wouldn't go she slept 8 hours the fatigue wouldn't go 10 hours the fatigue wouldn't go and she's taking the pills on time the family is concerned 2 3 4 5 years and i mean you're switching the medications mood is better right. the fatigue factor and incidentally i treated her neighbor with sleep apnea she i ended up meeting her one week on cpap and she actually came back with her husband and he's like what did you do <laughs> i mean what happened and i mean it's it's not unusual to sleep apnea to be lurking there right. typically you will find this middle age so to say you know 50 year old gentleman right. who's not a fitness freak but who's not unhealthy in the standard metrics but feels like a 65 year old right and the problem there is perhaps sleep apnea also along with other thing so you, i mean the whole message is the way i do it for me i have to screen for sleep apnea so you know remember our medical college days where in the standard history taking we were told no history of bronchial asthma tuberculosis diabetes mellitus hypertension yeah. you can't present a case without it yeah. even if you are presenting anything can okay, people have made mnemonics of yeah, that yeah like yes. you have to mention no past history the real change will come in when we'll add sleep apnea in that beautiful because it is as common as that right. you need to take a sleep history of the patient right. because sleep especially if you're a neurologist you need to take a sleep history yes. especially if you're a psychiatrist you are a pulmonologist you're a metabolic physician you need to take yeah. sleep history yeah. i mean once once that thought process comes in just to jot it down like we jot down the bmi of the yeah. patient the weight of the patient how many hours do you sleep no down yeah do you feel fresh after waking up yeah 
and uh, what are you doing about it so so the way i see it our challenge or mm -hmm. our path forward right is that we need to increase awareness amongst doctors yes but we also need to go to the grassroots yes and increase awareness amongst People. Patients, yes, yes, absolutely. People who, are, who might not be patients. Yes. Uh, so say you are sleeping next to somebody who is snoring. Yes. You should have the awareness of asking them to get it tested. Yes, yes, yes. Because yes. I'm assuming that uh, snoring and obstructive sleep apnea has a toll on relationships as well. Oh, big time. So, uh, so big part of the patients who come in, hmm. and that's a good and bad about the awareness bit in the sense that the wife or the husband. Yeah. of the snorer uh, mm. tends to bring in the snorer yeah. the snorer doesn't know why his time is getting wasted yeah. he's a busy guy or a busy okay. lady and the snorer feels that he's fine yeah and i'm just here because she can't sleep <laughs> that's not my problem so you need to treat her right and not me and i mean i would say india is still a very forgiving country spouses still adjust yes not so much in the west and it does affect na imagine see so gone are the days where you will have the lady of the house and i'm using the stereotype male here um, ladies equally have a lot of sleep apnea it's not mm -hmm. that they don't have mm -hmm. uh, but just to give you a stereotype of of the regular household so to say expect a lady who's who has a job yeah. who's taking care of kids she needs to wake up early in the morning and when she comes to bed she cannot get sleep yeah. she's tired and there is a motor running next to her and you know yeah. you know the ganpati baja goes on only for 10 days but this yes, is like a never is. ending thing right and and in a city like bombay how many rooms do you think each person has for themselves correct like i don't think many people have a 4 bhk where they can go and sleep in a different room you know and yeah. i mean and it's a psychological thing right yeah you're sleeping away from your husband you're sleeping yeah. away from your wife yeah. you can't adjust with him So I mean, it's 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 a lot of emotional so toll that way. To this yes, and yeah. and we are already stretched out, right? I yeah. mean, like so in in many ways, living yeah. in Bombay is not stress free for sure, right? So I mean, so yes, it does play, and secondary problems can arise. But even the person, I mean, actually, it's just about talking to the person who's suffering. Yeah. Most of them will agree they don't feel fresh. Internet, for once, has helped mm. because a lot of them would Google and come in. Yeah. Sometimes it scares more than what is needed, but uh, for sleep apnea, anything is good, right? I mean, in that sense, that any word that spreads, because I mean, so andere ko chirak ki jorwat hai. I mean, it is that that we are dealing with darkness right now. Awareness is Absolutely. rock bottom. Even when it comes to say sharing a space, mm -hmm. um, one interesting thing I've noticed is it's not just an adult problem. This oh. problem of snoring and even obstructive sleep apnea. can affect children as well don't get me started so pediatric sleep apnea is something that uh, currently i mean we are seeing hordes of it mm. uh, it's very common in children and by very i mean on an average in a day i mean i would see at least 5 kids with sleep apnea wow on a daily basis that's a big number that's a big number um, and snoring in children to it is considered cute i think perhaps like you know so yeah like now we know kid has slept every parent is happy that the kid has slept right. and one one thing again about awareness i mean something that gets missed i would say by a mile big time and the impact on the kid is permanent in mm -hmm. the sense that uh, there is enough and more research to show that if kids develop sleep apnea which essentially will be very innocuous symptoms mm -hmm. will be mild snoring frequent colds which every kid has right i mean in that sense yeah. uh, mouth breathing at night bed wetting with something right. the parents will never include with sleep apnea right um, and they will consider it to be normal till the age of whatever like you know i have 7 8 year olds who are still bed wetting and uh, you treat their sleep apnea a lot of that settles and many times bed wetting is also considered purely psychological yes the boy is stressed out yes. he's not feeling well so i have parents who come and tell me you know what He doesn't bed bed because I wake him up at three o'clock. Yes. Make him go to the washroom, then he comes back to sleep. So he's not bed wetting. Oh, he's just wearing a diaper in the night. Yeah. He's not wetting the bed. <laughs> so I'm like, he's five year old. Yeah. Why do you think a diaper is required still? Right. And uh, so I can understand occasional bed wetting during colds and all, but yeah. if somebody is frequently bed wetting, grinding of teeth in the night, yes. talking in sleep, sleep talking is a big symptom. Right. Which again, I would say. 
these are all symptoms which may happen because of other reasons too right a lot of them get rightly so bundled as normal but if you have all of them happening then you need to think further yeah. and these guys are having disrupted sleep so if you have a child who's not sleeping in the night mm. well how do you expect him to perform in school yeah. once he wakes up so it's a waterfall effect one it's, thing leads to another absolutely so there is actually there is a very interesting research i mean something that attracted me to the field of sleep apnea mm-hmm. was an article which got published in 2014 in new england journal of medicine it's called the chat trial you can look it up it's about early adenotonsillectomy mm. to treat sleep apnea what happens if somebody has been breathing from their mouth for a long time so you don't need long time hmm. i mean i all i mean a simple way to test the benefit or the downside of nasal breathing is just block your nose hmm. you're going to breathe through your mouth hmm. short term you're going to feel tired exhausted because you're spending five times more energy breathing through your mouth just maintaining your oxygen levels you're not going to feel oh. very rested five times more energy five times more energy just by blocking your nose just by breathing. blocking your nose breathing through your mouth your posture is going to become like this to align right on a day with cold ask people with allergies with stuffy yes. noses why they are irritable they are out of energy their entire day okay because they are just breathing to survive you remember kids will never complain kids adapt adults complain so that's why you can pick up a nose block in a adult right in kids they are so busy in their world they are so full of energy okay. they don't they know what to describe a them. nose block they can describe pain bell right. because that is a life kind of threatening situation right but they will not say nose block even in kids they will never come and say a five year old will not come and say which is the most common age group that we see in nose block let's talk about uh, what happens when you don't get sleep sure so if there is sleep deprivation and we've all been there right uh, medical students so yes. I, i think everybody has gone yes. through those yes. two three days of sleepless nights yes. either while preparing for an exam yes. or during residency yes so we know what acute sleep deprivation does yes you know you are feeling irritable you sure. can't focus but what is chronic sleep deprivation do so i think i mean i am guilty of this also hmm. especially during my college days even on the days that you know we would get time to sleep we would catch up on our movies yes i mean now it has become even more accessible right yep. otts are there to help us catch up with whenever we want and i used to always feel i mean in my college days that sleep is a criminal waste of time you know why sleep and waste your time i mean like you need only sleep as much as you require i yeah. feel fresh with 4 hours right. i feel fresh with 5 hours in fact it's a it's something yeah. to brag exactly i sleep only 4 hours yes and that's a problem yeah because i mean even if you see the culture around us encourages us to be more productive and that is the problem have you have you read this um, interview the founder of netflix aha uh-huh. said that um, we are not competing with uh, sports and uh, movies right we are competing with sleep oh so no so, <laughs> so uh, yeah so the challenge is right now and i mean they are really they are winning the war i feel <laughs> they are winning the competition by a mile yeah. i feel so yeah. uh, see what we have realized see uh, sleep per se why did why are we talking so much about sleep today hmm uh why not 30 years back I mean the doctors were not what not dumb that time to mm. not pick up symptoms why are we talking about it right now is because as a society we are moving towards being ever open yes working 24/7 uh time zone agnostic yeah. okay so many of our friends colleagues patients are doing shift work yeah we are going to be the next uh service backup for the entire world as a nation yeah okay we are doing back end work for europe america yeah, yeah. you know so, so we are much of the world as per their timelines yes yeah and we are pushing ourselves yeah the bpo industry has come up in the last 30 years yeah maybe 25 years yeah. and when we started pushing ourselves is when we are realizing the benefit of this chronic sleep deprivation so to say yeah um so there was i mean uh, there is multiple research in this so acute sleep deprivation if we don't sleep for a few days will make us irritable will not be ourselves uh we'll be not making good judgment calls um if we are in important positions like uh, taking decisions um or managing heavy machinery 
Yeah. Uh, we have had major industrial accidents happen because the yes. crew slept off on the wheel or uh, there is some data to suggest that uh, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was because perhaps the workers were not well rested. Yeah. Uh, a major oil spill uh, yes. off the coast of Alaska perhaps happened because the crew was a little overworked. And uh, so acute sleep deprivation we all relate to. Chronic is something that gets celebrated, um, unfortunately. And people try to catch up on the weekends, which is a, again another trend which is catching up. Um, so the chronic sleep deprivation, to answer your question, um, can lead to you be constantly drowsy, yeah. um, not being fresh. Unfortunately, it reduces your awareness that you are sleep deprived. So if you're chronically sleep deprived, you will feel that you don't need much sleep. This is normal. This is normal. Right. Being tired is normal yeah. because I am 40 years old now yeah. and I don't exercise much. So that's why I'm feeling that way. And all my friends are feeling the same way. So exactly. Maybe this is and, okay. Uh, I mean, our corporate culture also encourages that, right? Correct. We encourage an employee who will give in long hours. Yes. More than productive hours. Oh, you did overtime. You well did overtime done. and you're going late. You're coming up. You are doing cross-continent flights. Yeah. You are, you know, hopping countries. In seven days, you have done three continents and then you are back. You're a, you a he-man. Yes. And you're taking that late-eye flight and all yeah. of that. Um, but it will age you faster because you're not resting your body enough. Yeah. And there is enough data to show that it will um, affect your metabolism. You're more prone to cardiovascular diseases. You're more prone to diabetes. You're likely to gain weight. So there was a very interesting study, I think out of Colorado, mm -hmm. they took 36 participants, divided them into two halves, uh, one half or rather three, three parts. One half slept well, one third of them slept well, one third only got five hours of sleep every night and one third of them got five hours of sleep over the weekdays and they were allowed to recover their sleep over the weekend. So there's this concept called sleep debt. Yes. So people think that they can pay off the debt on the weekend. Yeah. But this is a debt not from a good bank. This is a debt from the mafia, so to say. <laughs> you know, you have to pay heavy penalties. So what they found out in their research was very interesting. So you are typically expecting an individual to sleep at least between seven to nine hours. So these individuals were allowed to sleep only five hours. So over a week, they had a 10 to 12 hour deficit. Over the weekend, they typically caught up only three hours of that. Okay, so instead of the standard eight hour sleep, say, um, they were sleeping five, so three into five, 15. And they were able to caught up, I think, three to four hours over the weekend. So they have really not paid off the debt. Yeah. And what do you think this gentleman will have on a Monday morning? He'll have a Monday morning blues. Yeah. Because as you know, I mean, you're a neurologist, the melatonin is still not washed out of the system, right? Yeah. So he's still feeling groggy. Yeah. And he's blaming that's Monday morning blues. He's not slept off. And imagine, you know, accumulating that debt over a period of weeks, months and normalizing it. Yeah. So chronic deprivation is the new pandemic, if I may say so. And I mean, I think awareness is key. Uh, there are some organizations, uh, there are some corporates uh, which are allowing uh, their uh, employees to adjust their work times as per their sleep requirements. I think Google does that. Mm. Um, there is some awareness there. NASA has been doing that for quite some time. Uh, but I think we'll also reach there, I hope, with the and awareness the, coming in. The best way to convince somebody of the importance of sleep, I have found is to ask them for, to sleep for eight hours yes. for a week. Just try it out. Yes. And see the difference. Uh. And they'll realize that they have not felt this way in a long time. Oh, but it's difficult, right? I mean, there is yeah. so much to do. Yes. I mean, I mean, uh, so, I mean, you need to, I mean, I feel it's the biggest luxury. Even if, like, you know, you ask the guy with, you know, the Forbes top list and the richest guys around. I mean, if you tell them which is your biggest luxury, it will be, they'll say, time <laughs> and sleep. So, but, but that's a message which has to come across nationwide. It has to, there has to be no guilt attached to that right 
it has to come as part of the culture like it's saying i am going to sleep should yes. not be a sign of weakness a sign of weakness it should not be that i'm lazy yeah it's like you know how we discourage uh smoking yeah how we discourage uh substance abuse right. alcohol right. and we discourage sleeping pills right which is also a good thing in the sense that uh, but we should discourage unnecessary long hours in the night right. especially so, for kids who are preparing right you know their right. exams the corporate guys i mean Absolutely. we should we should we should discourage them so just right. like saying sorry i don't drink ha uh-huh. we should be able to say sorry i don't stay up late yes and which is which is okay i mean like okay. i mean i think our friends will understand but i mean i think it should it I'm should i'm not sure mine would actually <laughs> <laughs> no no i've started doing that so late nights are not for me anymore but yeah, yeah but i mean i was a very late night person myself but yeah. you can see the change and the benefit but yeah. like you said it has to come as part of a society push yeah you it shouldn't has to feel normalize. such a rebel yes trying to do that yes Yes, yes, you should. Yes. So if I have to bring it down yes. to very simple to-do lists, yes. Okay. If you had to advise society, mm-hmm. five things sure. that you can do to create a healthy lifestyle, as right. far as sleep is concerned, sure. Could you have a list like that? So very simple things. Yeah. I mean, first thing is start understanding like how I feel sleep is a very integral part of a healthy life, like how good nutrition and exercises are. Hmm. it's as important as getting the right diet and exercise in your lifestyle yeah because you're not going to sleep well that good diet that you're eating is not going to help uh so uh first time or schedule or pencil in at least 8 hours of sleep in your routine um and the second thing would be get a routine <laughs> you know have as far as possible fixed meal times as far as possible which is difficult i'm not saying it's not but i mean once you get it on your priority list then i think it's doable yeah. get fixed uh, i was say sleep times yeah. uh keep your bedroom only for sleeping and sex mm. don't make it your home theater don't yes. make it your you know party den mm. don't make it your kind of like you know reading chamber for that matter as far as possible especially the bed mm. the bed specifically those people who find it difficult to fall asleep who are very sensitive to sounds should treat the bed as we would treat temples we only go in our temple room to pray right. we don't go there and listen to music we don't go there and watch movies we just go to pray right. similarly the bed should only be for sleeping right. and for sex nothing else right. um that gives the message to the mind that this is my resting place yeah i'm not going to get excited and i think problem is our hostel days because we are used to doing everything from our projects to watching yeah. movies on our hostel beds yeah preparing for exams and because in the hostel room yes that's the only space that you can that's yours s- that's yours that's yours yes. that's home yes so you tend to associate the bed with or oh, whatever you want to do yes on your laptop you're yes. you're scrolling you're yes. writing things you're listening yes. to music yes so i can understand why that happens but we are not it's in a comfort hostel zone. anymore it's it's your comfort zone it's a comfort zone but you're not in the hostel anymore and you're not working 18 hours a day anymore Correct. i mean at least for most bit Correct. and uh, you're not 18 anymore so i mean so you need to realize that i mean i mean i'm not saying that for teenager it's okay but uh, i mean if there is enough space in your hostels don't do it on the bed i right. mean like don't study on the bed right. you know study on the table and uh, i mean as much as possible yeah because Please these do environment that. cues matter yes yes yes, yes. second thing is a uh, third thing rather is the most obvious is screen exposure hmm. our ever present ever friendly so technically we were designed to have a lot of dark exposure every day yeah evenings were supposed to be dark which allows the brain to set up their own sleep rhythm or circadian rhythm as we speak mm-hmm. which encourages production of melatonin which is the hormone which initiates sleep yeah. in the modern day there are a lot of lights around all the time so the brain gets confused um, at least an hour if not an hour then at least half an hour you should try to reduce or just avoid the screen and it all comes with having a routine yeah. 
like if you want to sleep at 11 ideally you should finish by your dinner by 8 by 10 30 you should say no screen time right or 10 o'clock say no screen time and develop a nighttime routine yeah. i give the analogy of say parking your car mm. you're driving your car the whole day at 60 70 80 kilometers per hour nobody can park a car at that speed <laughs> right you have to slow yourself down right even the best drivers even the f1 drivers have to slow themselves down and pay a lot of attention and respect the parking space right okay they have to take they have to park it in a proper place you are parking your body you can't be thinking about the meeting tomorrow morning you can't be replying to emails on your bed can't be reading the twitter feed waiting for the match right you have to park your body at 80 kilometers an hour if you try to park your body you will just crash so you should not crash into a bed yeah it should be a process right it should be a process like you know that you slow things down right. and that's a message to your brain that it's not under any kind of a threat anymore because we are all animals at the end of the day right and it's also the terminology right because we say this all the time yes i'm crashing yes don't crash yes love yes. it yes yes that's so beautiful. you should you should slow it down and yeah. that's a control right yeah you know that's that's i mean if you slow it down you will have control over your mind if you let it run amok you will be lying on the bed even when you have given time for 2 hours thinking about whatever right yeah so don't and do that people wonder why they can't sleep that's correct mm. if you don't have fixed sleep times yeah. so i mean a request to all my colleagues and friends and everybody who's out there if you are doing the us shift live the shift on the weekend too mm. don't try to normalize your weekend as per indian standard timings yeah because that breaks the routine as far as possible and i know it's harsh i mean it's difficult you know you have a kid who wants to spend time with you and the weekend yeah. is all there but as far as possible don't try to change your schedule yeah it's like you know flying out of us every weekend then to india you're going to have a bad jet lag every yeah. time you do that yeah so for anybody who's doing into shift work very important to set your entire day yeah. even the weekends to that yeah. and then there are certain other things that you can do people who find it difficult to sleep um they should uh, essentially um uh, not keep any clocks in the room oh really yes so there is actually research to this so what happens is when you go to the bed you are constantly focusing on the clock uh 12 baj gaye neend nahi aa rahi hai 1 baj gaye neend nahi aa rahi hai yaar kal subah 6 baje uthna hai fir wapas se uthna hai and you know you have these uh, alarms in this uh, android phones actually do that a lot in my experience this is that um, they will have an alarm when you set that alarm they will say Five hours and forty-nine minutes left. <laughs> so that's the message your brain gets. Today, at night, you will not get sleep. So it's 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 like you know you need to look at these subtle messages because right. we we absorb a lot of it, right? Because that's so, an anxiety-inducing. Exactly. Sentence. And the other thing is, if you're finding it difficult to sleep, don't spend more than half an hour on the bed. Hmm. If you feel that you're not getting sleep, get up, get out of the bedroom, do something calming, hmm. and come back to the bed only when you're sleeping. sleep when you are sleepy okay don't try to make it a punishment okay i will not move out of this bed mai dekhta hu kaise neend nahi aati hai and uh, those things you know you are fighting uh, your own body yes mm. and that is what you want to leave all the fights right yeah before you go to bed you want to relax the mind you want to tell the mind that is all is calm yeah all is well you are not under any kind of threat and uh, that is how you'll rest so in that same line i want to just add a point on what to avoid in order to get good sleep like stimulants coffee what do you what is your take on that so i mean in fact uh, on this note i mean i was going through shelf through uh, you know like a supermarket mm -hmm. there are very little drinks available which are either not caffeinated nowadays or not calorie rich right so you have to you go for juices or something which is they all have high sugar levels right you go for these coke zeros and i don't want to take names but any of these diet drinks so to say yeah. or energy they're drinks energy drinks so energy drinks so their intention is to give energy so to say mm -hmm. so it is very difficult to avoid caffeine in today's day and age yeah. it's omnipresent so to say uh, i love coffee so uh, but what we know about coffee is caffeine is a big stimulant and uh, you should so earlier we used to think that 6 to 8 hours is a good gap because that's coffee's half life 
as you know half life means that that is when whichever medication or drug that you take half of that is still available in your system yeah so if you take a paracetamol the half life is around 4 to 6 hours um for caffeine it is 6 to 8 hours so what that means is after 12 hours too that's the quarter life mm. so a quarter of caffeine intake is still there 12 hours 10 to 12 hours down the line right so if you had that mug of coffee strong coffee at say 5 in the evening which is not late time for coffee right yeah how do you think you'll fall asleep at 11 cuz it's still in that half life yes right. and still i mean if not in the half life definitely before its quarter life is over right so i love coffee but i at least try to target taking that coffee latest by 12 in the afternoon that would be my recommendation not 3 hours before bed time not 6 hours before bed time and by coffee i mean anything with caffeine mm. any stimulant that you want to take and the funny bit is it it's not the same for everyone in that sense i have friends who vouch that coffee does nothing for them mm. and i'm happy for them <laughs> uh, but if you are actually struggling with these things yeah like if i have one energy drink or two of this diet soda things i'm done i'm not going to get sleep till like 4 in the morning right. and uh, and that's not much right you go out for a dinner two diet sodas are not a big yeah. thing over a period of what couple of hours but that is something that people should watch out for yeah. especially if they are finding it difficult to initiate sleep yeah um, so stimulants are not good too late in the day what about alcohol now uh, so uh, a lot of people uh, tend to take a night cap so they like to take their one peg of whiskey or just before sleeping because they are like this is my sleeping aid um and i like to use this to put me off to sleep the problem with alcohol is so we know that it essentially depresses overall the brain function it's not a stimulant in that sense yeah whatever stimulation it does it's by so to say depressing the frontal lobe right and freeing the mind so to say again if you go by the half life of alcohol it is 3 to 4 time a uh, 3 to 4 hours hmm. so what you will get is actually you will get a very bad insomnia or breakage of sleep so if you had uh, i don't know whether you have experienced this if you take uh, two or three pegs of alcohol uh, close to the dinner you will the alcohol will wash out of your system at around 4 in the night and then you are wide awake yeah at 4 in the morning and then you are like okay i mean this is not working yeah. so you actually get what we called as rebound insomnia right. it's putting you fast asleep and then when it is washing out you are bouncing back correct and waking up i had read about the neurotransmitters sure in the brain uh, so because alcohol acts on gaba receptors yes. and it uh, uses up all the gaba receptors yes um the brain starts producing um uh, once alcohol gets washed out right. there is a glutamate rebound yes so glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter yes yes, yes. Uh, and so because of that your brain thinks that uh, there is there has been too much gaba activity going mm-hmm. on and now it needs to recorrect itself so to the brain it is just resetting back to normal yes but for you now you can't sleep yes because now there is there are no more gaba receptors available at yes. that time so you need to wait for them to get reformed in yes. order to go to sleep and i mean in the sense that uh, i mean all your binge nights yeah are the riskiest nights right yeah. i mean like because you're going to have an equally strong rebound yeah. and it's part of the reason why you have a hangover because yeah. you are dehydrated yeah you are uh, sleep deprived yeah. and uh, you're having all this acidity in the stomach uh you have probably not eaten well also the previous night so i mean it's a big part of that uh, headache that you get the morning after correct okay. so that's why alcohol again is not such a great thing to have okay. ideally there should be at least a 3 to 4 hour gap mm. it should be done and that's why the french wine culture perhaps you know of taking it early in the evening yeah and not so much you know a late night binge right. in the night so to say yeah uh, to say but i mean we don't recommend i mean we actively discourage patients uh, having alcohol at all alcohol at all so i want to discuss osa or obstructive sleep apnea from the perspective of a patient 
Sure. Okay. So there will be people listening to this podcast yes. and wondering, wait, do I have this? Yes. So what is the first thing they should do? What should they be aware of when they think about OSA? So first is the symptoms. Hmm. Actually, for the most bit, symptoms are pretty characteristic. You can't, I mean, uh, there are questionnaires. Uh, there are free tools available online. Okay. Um, a simple form of it is called as stop bang. Mm -hmm. Very, very simple mnemonic. So you have the STOP, which means that if you're snoring heroically, loud enough to disturb your partner, loud enough to be heard out of the room, then that's a red flag. If you feel tired, that's T, the next day, even after getting the good weekend sleep, like you get a good eight hour sleep on a Saturday, but Sunday morning, you still feel groggy. And that's happening often. That's a red flag. If somebody has seen you obstruct, so if you're and then you are somebody has seen you obstruct while breathing in the night. So that's the O. That's another big red flag. And P is for pressure. That if you have blood pressure issues, then again, uh, uh, snoring or sleep apnea is known to be a cause for blood pressure. Right. If you are sleep apnea patients, you are 11 times more likely to have blood pressure. Right. So you need to take care of that. Uh, then comes the bang. B is for BMI, that's mm -hmm. body mass index. And uh, in the Western context, it's 35 kilos per meter square. That's a very heavy person. Uh, the Indian frame body structure is thinner. So the Indian data is more closer to 30 kilometers, 30 kg per meter square. Yeah. So, and that's not very overweight. So if you are above that, and uh, we can share the formula for that for the viewers to decide for themselves, it is uh, weight in uh, meters upon height square. So uh, uh, there are again tools that you can measure, measure BMI yes, very easily. easily. Yes. Yeah. And uh, then there is uh, A is for age, bang, B A A is for age if you're more than 50, mm. N is for next circumference. Mm. So if your next circumference is more than 16 inches, Okay. Meaning you have a thick neck right. um, and G is for gender, so male. So if you're a male, more than 50, who's snoring, yeah. high chances that you have sleep apnea. Right. This is a very good tool for moderate to severe sleep apnea. Mm. However, if somebody is having, you know, disturbed sleep, more importantly, if I have a 40 year old or 35 year old reasonably healthy guy who is getting eight hours of sleep, does some snoring in the night, but still not feeling fresh in the morning, for me, that's a red flag. Right. Okay. And typically I would ask my bed partner about my snoring patterns. Yeah. They would tell and they can tell how it has changed, say in the last five years or so, and they can alert me and I should listen to them. Yeah. And that's a red flag. So once you feel that you are sleep apnea, I think the next step is not so much, I would say in major cities, but perhaps in smaller towns is finding the right doctor right. who is trained in sleep apnea. There are fortunately many specialities who get some form of training. Um, ENT is one of them. Pulmonology is also a very important speciality. Pulmonology is chest medicine. Chest medicine. Yeah. So your chest doctors, um, some neurologists are also interested in this. And there are certain dentists also who have taken this up. Right. So idea is anybody who has the idea about sleep apnea, who's trained in sleep medicine, should be a good doctor to approach. Right. Um, Typically, after assessing you clinically, which involves uh, history taking, knowing your symptoms, and also evaluating your airway, because mm -hmm. that is where the obstructions are happening. Mm -hmm. uh, we typically order a sleep study for the patients, which is just a fancy term for monitoring your variables at night. Right. So the traditional way, I would say 10 years right. back, would be to bring you in the hospital, make you sleep in the hospital overnight with a bunch of wires, Testing your oxygen patterns, breathing patterns, brain waves, muscle issues, yeah. everything. That is how the science has evolved in the last few decades. However, A, it, it's very expensive, as you can tell. B, it's very cumbersome. Yeah. And I think after COVID, it doesn't excite anybody to sleep in the hospital. Anyways, nobody is excited in sleeping in the lab. And you want natural sleep. You want people to sleep in their own comfort zone. You don't want them to sleep in a new place and find it difficult to sleep there. So there is a level three option, which is a very validated. It's current. It's our current workhorse for, I would say, 95% of our patients. Let your doctor decide. 
what he thinks is the best for you yeah. whether a level 3 home sleep study where you can do a mini version of this lab sleep study at home with equal validity reliability for the most bit and help you decide the treatment there are newer treatments available which are based on the pulse technology mm-hmm. or what we call as a pat technology peripheral arterial tonometry okay okay and which is actually pretty fancy so instead of all the gadgetry all you have is a small ring like thing that you have to wear in the night everybody is familiar with the pulse oximeter yes after covid so it's somewhat similar so it's i would say to simplify and it's not that simple but to simplify simplify it's it's an advanced pulse oximeter so everybody is comfortable especially people who find it sometimes difficult to sleep at night mm. with something you know in their nose or on their chest then it's a very good alternative but right. again please speak to your doctor yeah. if you are not a good candidate you don't want a false study right. you don't want to miss out on sleep apnea right. so that's that typically we make patients sleep for one to three nights and look for patterns of obstructions the metric that we use to measure the severity it's called the apnea hypopnea index mm. ahi was shot like how in diabetics we look for average blood sugar yeah at the fasting state after meals and the three month average called as the hba1c for sleep apnea currently it's not perfect but ahi is what we follow mm. uh, along with other things and the ahi indicates roughly the number of times during a night sleep that the patient stops breathing or breathes less than what yes. they should yes so there are two components to it right so typically what we look for is complete obstructions right. they are the apneas like the name obstructive sleep so apnea no breathing so there is so time. our definition is there should be cessation of breathing for at least 10 seconds right or more than 90% drop if mm. not 100% drop more than 90% drop in the airflow right okay so it's like a 10 second or two breaths so if you are looking for kids 10 seconds is too long because they have a higher breath time so it is uh, two breaths and uh, hypopnea is partial obstructions right so it's a complex definition we'll not get into it huh. uh, but essentially we look at the number of obstructions per hour of night right. so if i have 40 obstructions in the night that's five obstructions every hour right. for an 8 hour sleep so that makes my ahi as 5 mm. so anything below 5 is considered as acceptable right and um, there are caveats to that but typically less than 5 is considered normal 5 to 15 is considered as mild Fifteen to thirty is moderate, and more than thirty obstructions every hour is yeah. severe. Which means one obstruction almost every two minutes. Every every two minutes, and that's like a snooze alarm every two minutes. Right. So if right. you're going to have like thirty snooze alarm every hour, imagine waking up fresh. That's how disturbed your sleep is. Yes, that's correct. And the strange thing is that there must be people out there mm-hmm. who are getting this kind of disturbed sleep, who still haven't been diagnosed. So average guy who walks into my clinic. I don't even remember the last time I'd seen a mild guy. So average guy who walks into my clinic is like 40 per hour. Wow. And the sleep study also studies your oxygen profile. It's right. not just the obstructions. So we look at how frequently you're obstructing, how frequently you're losing oxygen because there is a lot of oxygen fluctuations happening in sleep apnea. Right. And imagine your heart trying to manage the oxygen supply because it is changing so rapidly. Mm. so we have oxygen levels dropping down to 40% right 50% crazy levels right. anything below 88 is a red flag for us and that puts the patient at at an enormously high risk for heart related events mm-hmm. including sudden cardiac deaths massive heart attacks in the night right. so those are our red flag features so if there is somebody out there who thinks they have obstructive sleep apnea mm-hmm. there are comorbidities yes things that can make the sleep apnea worse what are those what should they so be looking at i would for? think of it the other way around hmm. see if you have what we called as drug resistant high blood pressure if you are taking more than one or two pills for high blood pressure con- pressure control and still the blood pressure control is not satisfactory if you are having a history of heart attacks talk to your cardiologist if they feel then you should be screened for sleep apnea right if you're obese like we discussed if you're having high diabetes um 
if you're having um, major metabolic issues, then you should definitely get tested for this. Studies have also shown that patients who have had stroke, uh, patients who have had major neurological conditions related to blood supply to the brain, mm. those benefit when they screen for sleep apnea. Yes. Epileptics, patients with seizures, yeah. fits, if they have sleep apnea, then their seizures may get worse if you don't treat them. You know, you're a neurologist. These two things, yeah. yeah. I have faced myself yes. in my uh, OPD. Yes. Patients who come with stroke and who don't seem to have any other obvious yes. reason. Yes. And you check them for sleep apnea and they have it. And they have it. So untreated sleep apnea has, I mean, I think studies have shown up to 43% higher chance of uh, developing strokes, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's. Untreated sleep apnea to to cut a long story short, are three to four times more likely to have a premature death. Right. So it's a oh. serious condition. I have patients who have been diagnosed with sleep apnea. They were averse to get it treated because they have not heard about anybody suffering from sleep apnea. Yeah. So they're like, doc, we'll come back to you. Uh, they were polite in the sense that uh, they didn't want to get treated. They just got diagnosed and that's fine. But... Uh, Two years down the line, unfortunately, they have a severe cardiac related event. They may have had a heart attack and then they come back to us. Doc, you had told us now we want to get it done. So, I mean, that should not be happen. That is what we want to avoid. Yes. You know, there are patients who have been diagnosed with sleep apnea and otherwise young and fit, not wanting any treatment, have met with a major car accident. I had a patient who came to me. Six months after the sleep study, and I was wondering why did she come back? She was a senior corporate honko, you know, one of the CXOs in a big firm. And she's like, Doc, I met with an accident uh, while I was driving down Surat. You know, you're getting all these Samruddhi expressways nowadays where people are driving, like we are getting like the Western roads, yeah. very likely for the driver to fall asleep on the wheel. And in that accident, her mother had an accident. So she's like, I blamed it on the other guy this time. But I know at the back of the mind, it was a sleep apnea, which made me fall asleep on the wheel. So, I mean, uh, it's serious stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. uh, I mean, treatment is required yeah. for sleep apnea. I mean, if you're having symptoms, get a sleep study. Yeah. If you have sleep apnea, don't ignore it. There has been so much learning here. I feel that there are so many points that uh, were really important to get out there into yes. the public. I hope that this conversation reaches a lot of people. Uh, I'm going to summarize just so that people understand all that we spoke about. Sure. We uh, talked mainly about the, the problem of obstructive sleep apnea, how it is both complex, but it is also very simple and how we should know about this, how the awareness of obstructive sleep apnea should be more widespread. Uh, we spoke about how it can be very subtle. Sometimes obstructive sleep apnea can present just as, you know, brain fog or confusion. It can even present as a low mood or a, a common symptom that people come with is gabrahat, you know, anxiety. They don't really know why they are feeling bad. And sometimes it is because of obstructive sleep apnea. So it's a very important disease to know about both for doctors and for the general public. The testing is so simple. You have to do a sleep study. And you have to check if are you breathing well when you are sleeping. And uh, there are ways to do that. So uh, ResMed is one company that you can reach out to. You can follow them. There is a free online assessment that you can take. As uh, you explained that there is a simple questionnaire that you can follow as a screening test. Yes. Uh, which is a very useful thing for people to remember. Yes. And uh, once you do have that screening done and there's a likelihood that you have the problem, the, as I said, the test is simple. And once the test is conclusive, uh, like you just explained, there are very clear treatment options that can probably save your life and completely change the way that you live. Uh, so I'm very glad that we had this conversation. My Dr. pleasure. Rahul, any, last, any last words, any last thoughts on this? No, so, I mean, I always tell patients, uh, uh, please don't ignore your symptoms. Right. Uh, follow a good routine. Sleep needs to be respected as you respect your diet, yeah. as you respect your routine. Yeah. And it is the easiest way to ensure a healthy life. You just need to sleep more. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, just, just take care of that is what, what, what I would say. Don't do forced sleep deprivation. To say the least. Yeah. And 
and if you are having symptoms like we discussed do meet a sleep specialist because once you sort them out you'll be a happy man or lady beautiful all right that's such an important message and with that we'll conclude this conversation thank you so much akrul thank you pleasure speaking with you pleasure is all mine yes speak to you soon yes. bye